Dom John VI was the king of Portugal during a time of war. Napoleon was on his way to conquer all of Europe under the French banner, and after Spain, the last bit of the Iberian Peninsula was next on his list. John fought back, but let's be honest, one tiny country trying to defend itself against this is not likely to go well. So he and his family fled to their wealthiest colony, Brazil. Then he left his kid, Dom Pedro I, to rule Brazil at age 23. He headed back to Portugal to deal with a series of revolutions there. Meanwhile, back in Brazil, Pedro I was having to deal with some revolutionaries of his own. Once the fighting cooled down a bit, the Kingdom of Portugal was going to remove Brazil's relative freedom, which was really unpopular. Pedro I sided with Brazil, declared its independence in 1822, and then spent the rest of his nine years left on the throne, desperately trying to quell the countless rebellions in the country. Then, with a civil war brewing in Portugal against some members of his family, he left to go deal with that issue, leaving his son Pedro II on the throne. And then he died from tuberculosis two years later. This is Pedro II. He, at age five, has just been crowned Emperor of Brazil. The empire is in chaos, with constant infighting among the Congress, slavery is in full swing, everyone around him is constantly fighting to be his regent, aka to basically rule the empire until he turned 18, and basically everybody was unhappy with the situation for a bunch of different reasons. So how did this five-year-old kid go on to be one of the best monarchs to ever live? Well, keep watching and I'll get right to it. Pedro de Alcantara, João Carlos, Leopoldo, Salvador, Bibiano, Francisco, Javier, de Paula, Leocadio, Miguel, Gabriel, Rafael, Gonzaga II was born in 1825 in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. He had a pretty rough childhood. His mom had died when he was a year old and his father left for Portugal when he was five and then died a year later, so he was mostly raised by a handful of court officials. He was only able to have fun for about two hours a day and had to spend the rest of his free time studying to be an emperor. He was crazy smart and picked it up super fast, but it was really stressful and he didn't like it at all. He couldn't have many friends and couldn't talk to his sisters much, so he ended up being pretty lonely for most of his childhood. Meanwhile, all of the more minor monarchs were trying their hardest to fight for regency. This battle was so long and excessive that eventually they just decided that Pedro was old and smart enough to be emperor. After all, if a bunch of fully grown men couldn't figure it out, then surely this barely pubescent 14 year old kid could, right? Yes, actually. Well, kind of. Having a king on the throne did settle a lot of the intrigue down, but the kid still had some issues. He was introverted, not a good quality in an emperor, and not very confident. He was arranged to marry Princess Teresa Cristina of Sicily when he was 17, who he didn't see until the wedding day, and then was visibly disappointed on first meeting her. However, he matured a ton about the time he turned 18. He was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, but unlike his uncle, he grew up to be quite tall at 6 foot 3 inches. Now a handsome, fully grown man, he was known for being patient and polite, yet with a firm hand, and managed to fully get rid of the monarchs who were trying to grab power. The first couple years of his reign had turned out pretty well. But then a bunch of major issues came up, starting in 1848. First of all, he had to deal with the illegal slave trade into Brazil. A bunch of European countries had already gotten rid of their slave trade, including Britain, who abolished the trade throughout their empire, plus some former colonies across the Americas had too. Hell, Haiti had abolished slavery completely by that point, as had a couple of former Spanish colonies. Brazil was late to the game at this point, and the issue was flaring up again. They had a deal with the British Empire that would criminalize the slave trade, but nobody ever enforced it, and people were still shipping Africans into Brazil to be sold into slavery at the same rate as they were before. The deal wasn't being held up, and the British Empire was getting pretty pissed. So what did Pedro do? The man signed a law declaring the slave trade to be piracy. He couldn't abolish the whole system yet since too many slave-holding plantation owners would get uppity about it, but he made sure it couldn't spread. He was shoving slavery out the door. After successfully navigating away from war with the British Empire and finally starting to get rid of slavery, Brazil became the regional powerhouse of South America. Despite being a monarchy, it upheld freedom of the press and a citizen's civil liberties, second only to the United States. And in comparison to the dictatorships that ruled over most of South America, Brazil's parliamentary monarchy looked pretty damn good. After those crises, Pedro moved forward with building up the nation. With his encouragement and approval, Brazil gained railroads, steamships, and the telegraph, making it about as modern as you could get for the 1850s. Pedro had a really unique form of ruling. He had some power, unlike the British monarchs, but also didn't wield absolute power like in Russia. He was more like a US president in terms of influence, using his power to push for good policies when possible, but never overstepping the bounds. Not only that, but Pedro II was an incredibly humble leader. Unlike the kings of the time, who all wore fancy clothing and hosted lavish balls, Pedro mostly just walked around in a black coat and only wore his full getup on special occasions a couple of times per year. 
He didn't really spend any money on jewels or ivory or plating everything in gold since honestly he thought it was a waste. His own wage started out as 3% of the government's budget, but due to refusing to raise his own wage for 50 years combined with inflation, by the end of his rule it had dropped to 0.5%. All of the money that would have gone to an excessively luxurious lifestyle for the emperor ended up being spent on the nation instead. A lot of this probably came from just not really wanting to be the emperor in the first place, but doing it out of a sense of obligation. He was cooperative and ungodly patient, a fantastic leader to take a divided country into a new age of technology and social development. All of this gave him his signature nickname, the Magnanimous, which basically means the forgiving or the generous. However, he had an issue. Although his marriage had started off rocky, his relationship with Teresa had gotten a lot better and they ended up having four kids. He had two boys and two girls, but the boys ended up tragically dying very young. And even though he loved his daughters and gave them great educations, he thought they would face too many challenges to be next in line for the throne. He thought that the title of emperor would die with him, and he would end up being right. Anyway, Pedro II was what we in the modern day would call a nerd. He would wake up at 7am, complete all of his imperial obligations, then read books endlessly until 2am the next morning. He was interested in basically every subject under the sun. And this is honestly the craziest fact about him. Buckle up. Because he was particularly interested in linguistics, he could speak, read, and write in Portuguese, Latin, French, German, English, Italian, Spanish, Greek, Arabic, Hebrew, Sanskrit, Chinese, Occitan, and Tupi. He spoke 14 languages. The man never once visited China, yet he could speak Mandarin. What on earth? He became the first Brazilian photographer and built photography, physics, and chemistry labs in the palace, alongside an observatory. He personally created a research institute, an opera house, and a public school, and a bunch of scholarships for Brazilian students. He was so excessively into funding scientific projects that Charles Darwin himself commented saying, every scientific man is bound to show him the utmost respect. Due to his connections with the scientific community, he ended up befriending Richard Wagner, Louis Pasteur, and Alexander Graham Bell. So yeah, things were going great. Brazil was modernizing, Pedro was personally funding the arts and sciences, and he was adored by his people. But some issues started to crop up. The British were once again pissed at Brazil, although this time for some really stupid reasons. And a civil war was cropping up in Uruguay to the south, with the violence and looting spreading to Brazil. Not wanting to look weak in front of Britain, the parliament decided to intervene, sending their army down south. Spotting an opportunity, the dictator of Paraguay invaded Mato Grosso do Sul while the Brazilian army was distracted. Knowing what was happening, Pedro II immediately traveled down to the war zone. Literally everybody in his cabinet thought it was a terrible idea, but Pedro went anyway, saying that if he couldn't go as an emperor, he would go as a soldier. The cabinet elected to let him go as emperor. He traveled by horse and wagon for a month, staying the nights in an average camping tent. He rode within rifle shot of a town occupied by the Paraguayan army, but they didn't shoot at him. He went down to strategize with his army and then headed back home. On the way, he received a diplomat from the British Empire, which was basically a direct apology from the Queen for almost going to war for really stupid reasons. He overlooked the war effort for the next five years, desperately trying to keep the political parties focused on fighting Paraguay instead of each other. He supported the ones who seemed most focused on that goal and openly denounced the ones who were just infighting for personal power. Eventually, the Paraguayan dictator died on the battlefield and the war ended. The General Assembly offered to build a statue of him riding a horse, but Pedro declined and used the money to build elementary schools. This guy. By the 1870s, Brazil was seen as the biggest bastion of progressive prosperity in the Americas, second only to the United States. The economy skyrocketed and people started moving in en masse. Railroads and steamships continued to be built, and the empire was on the up and up. But it still had one looming issue. Starting in Haiti in 1804 and continuing throughout Latin America, and eventually ending with the United States in 1865, the Americas had been abolishing slavery one by one. But the institutions still continued in Brazil, which was the country that had taken by far the most slaves during the initial trade. Almost nobody in Brazil opposed slavery, since almost everybody owned slaves. Pedro was an exception. He never owned slaves, and had freed the ones he inherited once he became emperor. He openly condemned the institution, but unfortunately, without the parliament's support, he didn't really have enough power to do anything about it. So he decided to use his good reputation and massive influence to speak out against it. 
The first time he did this was way back in 1850, when he threatened to give up being emperor unless Congress abolished the slave trade. In the 60s, he tried to make sure that the children of slaves would become full citizens, but then Paraguay declared war and he had to deal with that instead. Starting in 1867, he started openly pushing for a law like this in Parliament, which was massively unpopular. With a lot of convincing, using his reputation as a smart and kind-hearted man and his influence as emperor, he managed to get a law passed in 1871 that would guarantee freedom to the children of all slaves from that point forward. Now, slavery in Brazil was on a time limit. After many, many long years of war and political conflict, alongside the death of his daughter, Leopoldina, Pedro needed a break. He and his wife traveled to Europe, arriving in Lisbon, Portugal. He took a tour around Western Europe, Greece, and Egypt, and visited his daughter's tomb in Germany along the way. He spoke literally all of the languages of the countries he's visited. He insisted on not being treated like an emperor, going under a fake name and staying in hotels like an average citizen. He went sightseeing and took this picture in front of the Sphinx. Look at how happy he is. He went on another trip a few years later across the USA and Canada, where the locals greeted him with enthusiasm. Then he headed over to Europe again, where he went through Northern and Eastern Europe, into the Ottoman Empire and the Holy Land, and then back out through the way he came. He didn't speak as many of the languages of the nations he visited this time. What an under-accomplished man. He returned home unenthusiastic to continue being emperor. He never wanted the position in the first place, but kept going out of a sense of duty. He just really didn't want to be emperor anymore. In the 1880s, Brazil was still in a golden age and was even undergoing an early push for women's rights. But after 55 years of doing a job he never wanted, Pedro was exhausted. He kept doing his duties just as well as before, but he wasn't getting any enjoyment out of them. The politicians he had worked with for ages began to die or retire and got replaced by a bunch of newer ones who saw him as a useless old man. And while Pedro loved his daughter, he and the other elites didn't think a woman could hold the throne of Brazil. And honestly, considering the amount of pushback and controversy she would have gotten, and ended up getting, Pedro was unfortunately probably right. By 1887, his health was getting worse and worse. He was 62 at a time when most people didn't live all that long. He went to Italy to get professional medical help and was on the brink of death for two weeks. During that time, his daughter Isabel, in his stead, signed a law completely abolishing slavery across the empire. He reportedly wept with joy. One year later, the nation welcomed him back with unbelievable enthusiasm. The monarchy was at the height of its popularity after 35 years of prosperity and the complete abolition of slavery. And despite worries that without it, Brazil would suffer economically, it didn't end up being true and the 1888 coffee harvest was a success. However, starting this year began one of the weirdest events I've ever seen from any history I've read. In most places around the world, revolts happened at a time when people were being oppressed. For example, the Americans originally rebelled against the British because of a tyrant king who was levying ridiculous taxation. And since they had no people in Congress, there was nothing they could do about it. In Brazil, however, due to having such a benevolent empire for so long, virtually everybody was still in favor of the monarchy but the handful that weren't were mostly in the military, which is never good. So one day, a handful of army men just waltzed into the palace, arrested the prime minister, and established a republic. And since Pedro didn't really do anything about it, that was it. He had become so apathetic that the empire just sort of dissolved. Pedro II, now just a citizen, lived in exile in Europe for the last few years of his life. He became depressed and nostalgic, wishing to return to his home of 65 years. He caught pneumonia and died two years later in France, in December of 1891. His family held his funeral in Paris, with people all over the world attending. 300,000 people participated in the procession, in cold winter rain. Pedro II was a remarkable emperor, intelligent, forgiving, generous, and a master of compromise. He pushed the nation forward into the future, defended its borders, and was integral in ending its greatest sin. But even more remarkable than that was what he wasn't. He could have simply sat on his throne, living a life of incredible luxury, on the backs of slaves and with no regard for the people around him. Yet despite the immense power he was given, he was never self-indulgent and never tyrannical. He's possibly the best example of a person who was born into privilege and used his power for the good of the people. And I think that's pretty damn admirable. <laughs>
Plus, the man was just absurdly smart. I mean, 14 languages. Come on. I mean, who in their right mind just learns Sanskrit for the fun of it?